أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض وله الحمد في الآخرة وهو الحكيم الخبير والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث إلى كافة الورى بشيرا ونذيرا وداعيا إلى الله بإذنه وسراجا منيرا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى أهل بيته أئمة الهدى ومسابح الدجا الذين أذهب الله عنهم رتس وطهرهم تطهيرا بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتابه الكريم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم لن تنالوا البر حتى تنفقوا مما تحبون صلوا على محمد وعلى محمد My respected elders brothers and sisters in Islam salam alaykum wa rahmatullah in today's lecture, we will be examining the concept of true ownership with reference to Nabi Sulaiman ala Nabiyyina wa alihi wa alayhi salam. And as we saw a couple of days ago, Nabi Sulaiman was given extraordinary blessings by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So just as a reminder, he was given special powers and special knowledge on top of this vast kingdom. So he was able to know the language of birds and other creatures as well. He had birds, many of them in his army. Even jinn would dive in the seas for him and they would find hidden treasures for him. And they would build things for him such as temples and other things. He was also able to control the wind. But amazingly, Nabi Sulaiman never used these miraculous powers and these blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to lead a luxurious life. Rather, what he did was he devoted all of these things to the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In fact, we know from traditions that he was a very devout worshipper he would stay up all night and he would weep to Allah during the night as well. So I would like to examine the whole concept of true ownership and in particular as to how we can follow perhaps in the footsteps of this great Prophet of Allah to use everything that we have in the service of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just as an example that is mentioned in the traditions about this great Prophet, so one day there was a farmer and he sees Nabi Sulaiman's entourage from a distance. And from his far off perspective, he sees Nabi Sulaiman with, this, with all of his entourage and he says to himself that the, the son of David has been given a great kingdom. Now remember I mentioned a few moments ago that he had control over the wind. Well, the wind took the words of that farmer to Nabi Sulaiman. When Nabi Sulaiman heard what the farmer had said, he got down from his horse and he walked over to the farmer. He went up to the farmer and he says to him that, I have walked to you in order to tell you to be fearful of what you wish for. Do, because do not wish for that which you don't have the strength to bear. Don't wish for that which you don't have strength to bear. And then he says to him that one word of praise for Allah made in sincerity, one word of praise to all of Allah that will be accepted by Allah is better than everything that has been given to the house of Dawood. For that word of praise for Allah 
will have a lasting effect whereas the kingdom of Sulaiman will inevitably perish what beautiful words of wisdom and what an example to show his asceticism his whole devotion of everything he had for the work, for the service of Allah not to lead a luxurious life what didn't he have from Allah but still he's telling this farmer and it's a message for us as well that be careful of what you wish for do not wish for that which you don't have the strength to bear and instead one word of praise made in true sincerity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is better than the whole kingdom that was given to the house of David because that will last whereas all of these material things even the kingdom of Sulaiman he says will event eventually perish in fact just like Nabi Sulaiman other great leaders of Islam such as Rasul al-Akram sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Mawla Amir al-Mu'mineen sallallahu alayhi wa sallam they ruled over vast people and vast lands but again just like Nabi Sulaiman they didn't use it for worldly benefit they didn't use it for themselves they didn't use it to lead a luxurious life at the time when they were leading the Muslim Ummah what didn't the Holy Prophet have what didn't Imam Ali have or could have had well they had and they could have had every single thing but they used it to implement divine laws and values for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala I'll give you an example from the life of Amir al muminin It's reported in Nashu Balaga that when he set out to war in the battle of Jamal, they get to a place called Ziqar. When they get to that place, Abdullah ibn Abbas sees Mawla Amir stitching his own shoe. Now let me ask you this, which leader do you know in the world that would stitch their own shoe? In, in fact, what we should be asking is how many pairs of shoes do they have? But Mawla Amir was doing that and then when Abdullah ibn Abbas saw him, he comes to him and he sees him doing this, Amir al-Mu'mineen asks him this question. He says to him that, what price would you give to this shoe? And Abdullah ibn Abbas replies by saying, well, it has no value. Imam Ali salam replies by saying, by Allah, this shoe would have more value for me than ruling over you were it not for the fact that by ruling over you, I may establish what is right and ward off what is wrong. So for Amir al-Mu'mineen, power and all of the worldly blessings, it was less valuable than that shoe that was torn and he was stitching up but for the fact that he could use that power, he could use that position in order to rule over the people for the sake of establishing what is right and warding off what is wrong. This is why these people had those positions of power and how they were able to use it. Just like we were saying the other night, it's not the world and the dunya itself. It's not the object itself. Most of the time, the objects themselves are halal but it's the intention with which we get those objects and how we use those things so ala muhammad wa ali muhammad so now let's look at this in a bit more depth the whole concept of true ownership and then we will look at some practical tips as to how we can get closer to allah by giving in his way and how it, be, it can be easier for us to give our things in the way of Allah and follow in the footsteps of Nabi Sulaiman and these great leaders. Well, when we look at the Quran, we see that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refers to his ownership in two main ways. He uses two words which are very similar when we first look at them 
And often, if we are not careful about looking at the meanings of words, we will just pass by these two words without really paying attention as to what the difference is between them. Those two words are mulk and malakut. And we read verses about these concepts all the time. For example, in Surah Mulk, how do we start off in, when we read Surah Mulk? Tabarak alladhi biyadihi al-mulk wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. It means that blessed is he in whose hands is the mulk and he has power over everything. Now mulk will for now will translate as sovereignty. So blessed is Allah in whose hands is sovereignty and he has power over everything. But in other places, we come across the word malakut. Now, they sound very similar. They're from the same root, meem, lam, and kaf. And we are also told that the malakut, just like the mulk, is in the hands of Allah. Where do we see this, for example? Well, the last verse of Surah Yaseen. For subhanalladhi biyadihi malakutu kulli shay wa ilayhi turja'oon. So here we say, so immaculate is he of all defects, in whose hands is the malakut, for now we'll translate malakut as dominion, the dominion of everything and to whom you will be returned. So now we have these two very important concepts. The mulk is regarded as being in the hands of Allah, so to the malakut. What is the difference? Like I said, it's very easy to pass by these words in the Quran without paying attention and we think that they probably mean the same thing. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whenever He uses different words in the Quran, it's for a particular reason. There's wisdom behind it and there's deep significance why He uses different words in different places. Although they might sound similar and we are told both of them are in the hands of Allah. What is the difference? The difference is as follows. The mulk refers to the outer, material, physical aspects of everything. And it is the things that we see all around us, the things that we engage with all the time. Whatever we see and touch and feel and smell and all of these things, that is referred to the mulk, the sovereignty of everything. The outer, physical, material aspects. What is the malakut then? The malakut is the inner and the spiritual dimension of everything. This is the difference. When we say Allah owns the mulk and the malakut therefore, it means He doesn't just own what we see and touch and feel and smell and all of these outer material things, but He also owns the inner and the spiritual dimensions of everything that exists. Let me give you this example. It's like a bulb, okay? With the mulk and the malakut, the mulk is dependent on the malakut. So all of these outer things that we see, the physical material dimension of everything, it is dependent on the inner spiritual dimension, the malakut. Just like a bulb, when somebody takes a bulb, they plant it in the ground and then after a period of time, that bulb which contains all the nutrients that it needs is a reservoir of every nutrient that it needs. It now shoots up a beautiful flower that comes from under the ground where the bulb is and now what do we see? we see that beautiful flower in front of us. Wow. But that flower that we see, what is it dependent entirely on? It's entirely dependent on the bulb which we don't see. The bulb is under the ground, isn't it? And we don't see that. All we see is that beautiful flower. But if it wasn't for that bulb, that flower would not be there. It's the same thing in terms of the relationship between the mulk and the malakut. The mulk is the flower. It is the outer dimension that we see. It is a physical material aspect of everything that exists. What we don't see is the malakut. 
that is hidden from us. But the malakut is what the mulk is dependent on. Sallu ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So now, if we say in these verses that Allah owns both of the mulk and the malakut, it tells us exactly how high his level is. He's not just the khaliq of everything, but he's also the malik of everything. He's both the creator and the owner of absolutely everything that exists. Now, having taken that into account, let's go on to examine the whole concept of giving because we will see it becomes easier for us to give in the way of Allah the more we appreciate that Allah is the owner of everything. The more we realize Allah owns absolutely everything, the mulk and the malakut, and we don't own anything in reality, the easier it becomes for us to give in His way. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad But these are not my words. These are the words of Imam Jafar al-Sadiq sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. In that famous tradition known as the tradition of Unwan al-Basri, which I mentioned a few days ago, where the Imam first of all refuses to teach this person who is the narrator of this tradition called Unwan al-Basri, this 94-year-old man who came to the Imam and he requested the Imam to teach him when he comes to Medina, but the Imam initially refuses. Then after Unwan al-Basri persists, the Imam eventually agrees to teach him. And then he describes to him these wonderful gems of wisdom. So I won't go into the tradition, it's a very lengthy one. I spoke about it at some length the other night, but just one of the gems of wisdom that he tells Unwan al-Basri. It relates to our topic. He says to him that the true servant is the one who does not regard those things that Allah has granted him as being his own possessions. Allahu Akbar. The true servant is the one who does not regard those things that Allah has granted him as being his own possessions. They don't actually belong to him. Truly. As we have been saying, because Allah owns absolutely everything. Then the Imam tells him the result of this belief and this conviction that when somebody truly has certainty that he doesn't own anything, he goes on to mention the result. What is the result? What is the benefit of having this conviction that he doesn't own anything? The result is as follows. It makes it easier for him to give all of those things in the way that Allah has commanded him to give. Because it's like this, my brothers and sisters, when we know something doesn't belong to us, so somebody gives us an amana to look after, and he says that this is just something I would like you to look after, and can you give it in this way? Give it in that way. Use it in this way. Now, what can we say about that? Can we say no, that I'm not going to use it in this way, I'm going to use it in another way. If we have accepted, we have possession of these things, then we have to use it in the way that He has told us to use it. And we can't sell it and just make use of it as we like. It's an amana. We're holding it on a temporary trust for that person. It's the same thing with all of our possessions. Allah has given us an amana or amanas. He has given us blessings to look after. And He's saying, use it in this way. Don't use it in that way. Give it here. Give it there. It's not ours to now use it in a different way. We're just holding it on trust on a temporary basis. And therefore, if we truly have that conviction and that certainty that Allah owns everything that He has given me, then it should be very easy for me to give it in His way. So now, of course, at the dunyawi level, at the worldly level, yes, we can say at one level, we do own things. I own my clothes, I own my cell phone, I own my car, and so on and so forth. 
And therefore we have to abide by the rules and the laws of ownership and property. Yes, that is true. But that's just at one level. When we looked at the two levels of ownership, it's not just the mulk, but it's also the malakud. At the highest level, it is Allah who owns everything. And therefore, it should be easier for us to give in His way. But it all depends on the level of certainty that, that we have. How certain are we that Allah really owns everything? Let's now look at the three levels of certainty that are taught to us in the Quran. Sallallahu Muhammad wa Muhammad. We are told that actually somebody's conviction about something can be can have three levels. There is what is known as ilmul yaqeen. Then there is no what, what is known as Ainul Yaqeen, and then there is a level known as Hakkul Yaqeen. The knowledge of certainty, the vision of certainty, and the truth of certainty. So now the question arises, with what level of certainty, if certainty at all we have, do we know that Allah owns everything? Is it at the level of Ilmul Yaqeen? Is it at the level of Ainul Yaqeen or is it at the level of Haqqul Yaqeen? The higher the level of certainty that we have, the easier it becomes for us to give in His way. What are these three levels? Well, if I was to say that over there, there is a fire, okay? Now, somebody could believe in this, that there's a fire over there, they could have conviction. They could even have certainty that there's a fire over there. But that conviction can be at these three different levels. So, at the level of Ilmul Yaqeen, the person doesn't see the fire. All he sees is some smoke. And he uses his intellect. Without fire, there is no smoke. And so he puts two and two together, cause and effect. Wherever there is smoke, there must be fire. He doesn't see it, but he uses his intellect. That's why it's known as Ilmul Yaqeen, the knowledge of certainty. But he has the certainty that yes, there must be a fire there. Another time though, the person goes up to the fire and he's only 50 yards away from it now. And he's seeing it with his eyes. This is a higher level of certainty, isn't it? Now he knows there's a fire as did the first person, but this time his level of certainty is higher because he's looking at it, it's right there in front of him. This is known as Ainul Yaqeen, the vision of certainty. And the third level is not just knowing it with the intellect, not just seeing it or knowing it with the senses, but now the person goes in the fire. And so, there is a type of union formed between the knower and the known object. It is known as Hakkul Yaqeen. So now, if somebody was to ask that person, is there a fire here? What answer would he give when he's inside the fire? He would say, what are you talking about? What sort of question is this? Of course there's a fire here. I'm in it. I'm burning in it. He has absolutely no doubt whatsoever that there is a fire here. It is the highest level of certainty. So now, let's ask ourselves this question. With what level of certainty, if at all, we have reached that level of certainty and inshallah we all have, do we know that Allah owns everything? It is, is it at the level of knowledge of certainty? Or is it at the level of the vision of certainty? or the truth of certainty. Because the higher the level, the easier it will be for us to give. Because if it's at the level of Ilmul Yaqeen, then we will give. That is a praiseworthy level. Alhamdulillah, we have a level of certainty. We will give in His way. But usually, what type of giving will it be? It will usually be restricted to the wajib things the khums that we must give. Sometimes we might even give 
for the recommended things, some sadaqah or whatever it might be. However, when we give, it comes with a little bit of difficulty because our hearts are still attached to those material things. It comes with a little bit of hardship. We give because we have intellectual certainty that yes, Allah owns everything and so we must give when He says give this to that person or to that cause. And so we give usually for the obligatory things, sometimes for recommended things as well, but with a little bit of hardship because our hearts are still attached to it. However, the person who's at the second level of certainty known as Ainul Yaqeen, he also gives, but he gives without any difficulty. It's easier for him to give because now he knows that Allah owns everything at a higher level. So the highest level of certainty, however, is the one who knows Allah owns everything and he knows that with the certainty known as Haqqul Yaqeen. That person, not only is it not difficult for him to give in the way of Allah, but that person takes pleasure in giving in the way of Allah. Everything that he owns, he does not find it onerous at all to give in Allah's way because he is not attached to those worldly things. When Allah says give, he has no hesitation. He gives very easily and with pleasure. In fact, what do we learn from Surah Hijr, verse number 99? Qul, inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyai wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. This is the level that the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam was at. He said, Allah says, say, indeed my salah, my prayer, my worship, and my death and my life, everything Lillahi Rabbil Alameen is for Allah, the Lord of the worlds. This is that ultimate level of certainty that we should try and achieve. And inshallah, I'll try and put some practical measures as to how we can increase in our certainty later on. And then, just like the sixth holy Imam says, it's easier for that Abd to give in the way of Allah. Nobody can say that, you know, you know, I have nothing. What will I give? No one, no one can say that because we all have something. At least we have, if not wealth, okay, we are not wealthy perhaps. We are not, you know, we don't have the kingdom of Suleiman. But what don't, what other things do we have? We have knowledge at whatever level. We have the fruits of our experience. We have health and energy. We have time. What don't we have that we can't give? Everyone can give something. When we talk about giving in the way of Allah, it's not always financially giving. It's giving time as well, energy, volunteering your services for the community, for the center. We see some rubbish on the floor, some trash, some litter. What do we do? Well, let, if we pick that up, we're giving some time, we're giving a little bit of energy for the sake of Allah. We volunteer to do this, we volunteer to do that in madrasa, in a, an event, a function, outside in the wider community. We help a person cross the road. We give our seat to the person who is more needy of it. We advise someone wherever we are. We are a source of blessings for other people. So nobody should say, I have nothing. I'm not wealthy. This doesn't apply to me. Every blessing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Nahal, verse number 53, Whatever ni'mah that you have, big or small, financial or otherwise, is from Allah. So if all the blessings are from Allah, we should be able to give it in the way of Allah. Salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So now, 
Let's gradually bring this lecture to a close by looking at some practical measures as we've been trying to do on the other nights as well. It's fine talking about theory, about history, about this and about that, but we should also try and put forward and implement in our lives some practical measures as well. So, just two ways that we should try and implement in our lives to increase our level of certainty and then that will make it easier to give in the way of Allah and thereby follow in the footsteps of great prophets like Nabi Sulaiman as he did with his great kingdom. So, the first way is through worship. Sincere ubudiya. Wa'bud rabbak hatta yatiyakal yaqeen. We want to increase in our yaqeen, isn't it? We want to increase in the level of our certainty moving from ilmul yaqeen to aynul yaqeen to haqqul yaqeen. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in this verse, uh, in, in the uh, verse which is Surah Al-Hijr, verse number 99. Worship your Lord until there comes to you certainty. So this is the first way. Through sincere worship, whatever we do, we have a very mukhlis intention that Allah, I want to do this purely for the sake of your pleasure. And Allah says, and worship your Lord until there comes to you yaqeen. So that's the first way. Whatever we do, let's try and do it purely for the sake of Allah. That gives all of our possessions, all of our blessings, a divine dimension. Then we realize this is not ours. We will rise in our certainty, as he says, hatta yaqeen yaqeen, and then we can give these things easier in the way of Allah. In fact, let's now look at another way. And that is the way of giving in Allah's way. So, this is breaking the attachments to worldly things. Building on what we said yesterday. So, what this means is, as just like that verse I recited at the beginning of this lecture. Verse number 92 of Surah Ali Imran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us what? You see, all of this is from the teachings of the Quran and the Ahlul Bayt mm. We just use the Quran as a manual of guidance. We have a problem, we look, at, we look at in the manual, what is Allah's guidance? We have this problem, we have that issue, we have this question. Everything is there. Allah says in this verse that certainly you will not attain Piety until you give what you hold dear. Give what you hold dear, that's when you'll reach the station of bir and piety. So now, what this is telling us is that when we give in Allah's way, we break those attachments. Remember yesterday I was saying that we, our hearts must not be attached to worldly things. It's not the worldly things themselves. It's the intention by which we gain them and it's how we use them and then our heart should not be attached just like the example I gave of the elastic band because then when our soul leaves our body it wants to go to the Akhirah but if it is attached to the world then those worldly things it will feel the pain just like a rubber band is stretching and then eventually snaps that is the pain that we will feel but if we give in the way of Allah what we hold dear then Allah says, you will attain the level of bir and piety. Let me just end with a reminder of that beautiful story of those who were able to give very easily in the way of Allah because they had reached the station of bir and of haqqul yaqeen that Allah owns everything. You all know it just as a reminder of the Ahlul Bayt when Allah describes their great giving in Surah Al-Insan. What had happened was that Imam Hassan alayhi salam and Imam Hussein alayhi salam salatullah wa salam alayhi salam had become ill and so 
the Holy Prophet and the Holy Lady Fatima and Imam Ali sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ajma'een kept a vow for three days that they would fast if they get better. So when they get better, now they have to fast. So at the time of iftar on, three, on these three nights, and we can all, you know, reflect as to how we are at the time of iftar. It's not easy, but on three separate nights, somebody knocks on the door. First, it is a poor person, then it is an orphan, and then it is a captive. On each consecutive night, when they knock on the door, they open the door. These three people, they ask them for some food. They readily give their food instead of them having it for their iftar and they just break their iftar on each night with water. So now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is reported that He reveals in some traditions the, the whole of Surah Al-Insan, other traditions, some verses including this one. وَيُطْعِمُونَ الطَّعَامَ عَلَىٰ حُبِّهِ مِسْكِينًا وَيَتِيمًا وَأَسِيرًا that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that they gave the food despite needing it. To who? To the miskeen, to the needy one, to the yatim, the orphan, and the asir, the captive. You see, this is what is meant by giving readily in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But not only does Allah describe their momentous actions, their actions were regarded as being so sincere and so pure that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala takes their words and He quotes them in His book. What, does, what do they say? Innama not imukum, not imukum li wajhillah la nuridu minkum jaza'an wa la shukura. Allahu Akbar. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala he regards it as being so, so special. He doesn't just describe what they did, but in the next verse, in verse 9, he quotes them. Their words become the verses of the Quran. For they say, We give li wajhillah for the pleasure of Allah. We do not want any reward, nor do we want any thanks. For us, is purely giving in the way of Allah. This is true giving because of that level of certainty that I reached of haqqul yaqeen and knowing Allah truly owns everything and therefore it's very easy for them to give in the way of Allah. As a summary therefore, today we looked at the whole concept of true ownership by referring to the great story of Nabi Sulaiman in the Quran. We saw how Allah had blessed him with a kingdom, special power, special knowledge, but he used them all in the service of Allah, not to lead a luxurious life, just like our other leaders such as Rasulullah and Imam Ali as well. Then we went on to see how Allah owns everything, for in the Quran, he talks about the mulk and the malakut being in his hands. And therefore, our sixth holy Imam says, that the Abd, who is a true servant of Allah, he realizes and he can, does not consider whatever Allah has given him as being his own possessions. And the result of this is that he can give easily in the way of Allah. This all depends on the level of certitude we have with regards to Allah's ownership of everything. It depends if we have level of ilmul yaqeen, or haq or aynul yaqeen or haqqul yaqeen the higher the level of certitude we have that Allah owns everything the more readily we will give in His way and it will become easier not just easier but even pleasurable for us two ways that we can increase in our level of certainty that Allah owns everything is first of all sincere worship of Allah and secondly through the means of severing our attachments to dunyavi things by giving those things that we hold dear, just like the Ahlul Bayt gave in that wonderful example mentioned in Surah Al Insan. Let's pray to Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. Oh Allah, 
Enable us to follow in the footsteps of Nabi Sulaiman and the great leaders of Islam, inshaAllah. O oh Allah, enable us to gain this true and highest level of certainty with regards to your ownership of absolutely everything. O oh Allah, therefore enable us to give easily in your way. O oh Allah, forgive us and our forefathers for our sins. Grant relief to all who are facing difficulty around the world and hasten the appearance of the 12th Holy Imam. Ajjalallahu ta'ala farju sharif. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah.